Hey guys, I have Roy Flores with me here. He's with New York University, NYU. First question to you, how did you get started with EDAC? That's an interesting story because, you know, when I was thinking or when I was going through my athletic training career, you know, there's only so many ACLs and shoulders and UCL elbows that you can see. So when my uh, mentor and my program director out at Stony Brook, Kathy Chansey, she contacted me and said, hey, the, the D2 rep, the District 2 representative is stepping down and we think that you'll be a good uh, fill-in for that person. Now, giving you a little bit of history, I had uh, worked with the Diversity Council on Campus at Stony Brook. So they know that I've done a lot of stuff on campus as well, as far as diversity and, and ELP and stuff like that. And so um, after a lot of deliberation within my own head and talking to myself and, and talking to others, trying to get the anxiety down, it's like, do I have enough information? Am I good enough to get into this? Um, I finally talked to people and they said, yeah, just go in there and talk and listen and, and make sure you understand it. And I think the most interesting part, after I said yes, the most interesting part about joining EDAC is that it's not a committee and it's not a council, it's a family. So that's the way that we talked about it and that's the way that it was, it was presented to us. And you know, meeting you on that committee and, and you know, going to in and out to discuss what topics we can, we can cover and other issues that, that might come up in a meeting to, to put on the agenda and to put on career day, I think it's, you know, it just made it an easier transition to, to take this leadership position. How has working in EDAC before helped with your current position in athletic training in terms of the presidency of New York now? Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, I think, when you talk about a leadership, you kind of talk about a hierarchy and where you have to go. So a lot of people think, well, if to be a leader, I'm going to start at my school level. I'm going to be, you know, part of the e-board for, for our local athletic training club. And then maybe I'll go to a regional position. And then maybe I'll do something for the state. Then I'll go district. And then that's how it goes. For me, I think I, I got thrown into, well, not thrown into, but I got offered the district position. And when I rolled off after five years, I was trying to figure out what was the next evolution for me. Like, you know, so I know that the evolution from my athletic training career was to go from, you know, just doing stuff in the class, in the clinic and in the athletic training room and on the field to actually going and sharing my experiences. So I think that's where the leadership aspect comes in. But I think being part of the district committees and being part of joint committee meetings in January and, and sharing all this information and all the, and listening to to what issues are being covered around the nation that are not just within my state and opening it up to other people that I can network with. Like I can contact anyone who I've met through networking at the district level. I can use them to help me out, you know, at this state level. So I think one, it gives me it gives me a, a it makes me have a different perspective to anyone else that's been in the position before. Because, you know, a lot of people that stay within the state, just are within the state, they haven't done anything outside of that, right? So I wanna make sure that, you know, I have all this background with me, so maybe I can change the branding of what the New York State Association stands for within New York State. We're not just looking for, you know, a lot of people have that stipulations, like, well, NYSADA is just all about licensure. And that's our focus, government affairs, government affairs, government affairs. I don't want that to be what everybody thinks of when they see these letters. I want them to think about, all right, so this is a family unit that, you know, we can rely on and talk about one another. Because I don't, I think leadership is about working together and listening to one another. And it's not just the views of one person, but it's the person that's taking the views of everybody and putting it all together. So I think that's, that's how you know the the EDAC committee has has helped me grow into into this position. So on current events right now, you you briefly touched on it before that you have a very interesting story about the Confederate flag. Yeah, I do. Um, when I was uh, when I was a little kid, you know, one of my favorite 
favorite television shows was the Dukes of Hazard. You know, so they had this car that they drove around in and it would do all these jumps and stuff and it was and it was called the General Lee and of course it had the flag on top of on top of the car. So, you know, when I would run around my friends and my siblings and my cousins, we were always like, oh, let's do these jumps on our bikes. And, oh, we're in the General Lee. We're going ahead and jump over stuff. So, you know, for me, I never thought of anything about race or anything. I just thought about these guys having fun, making fun of, of the mayor of the city and, <laughs> and just running around in this car and jumping and stuff and sliding across hoods. So, um, Fast forward to when I first started out as a young professional, I was traveling with a baseball team and we ended up at Longwood University in Virginia. And Virginia is, and that school is way out there, way, way out there. Um, I don't think, I think we got off the highway and it took a couple dirt roads with no lights to get to, to our hotel. Um, so the first day it was raining, so we didn't play our first day. So we played a doubleheader on Sunday. And as we're getting ready to do our hitting, you know, our BP, our hitting, you just hear this blasting down the street. And, you know, uh, where Longwood is, it's one of these small towns that has a one main street, you know, just like you see on, on television and everything else. So this music's blaring and the field is right up against Main Street. And you just see this older gentleman with his hands on a flag, a Confederate flag, and just walking down the street. And I look out and my team looks out there and just like, we ain't in New York anymore, <laughs> you know, we just got this, this feeling is like, all right, so, you know, what is going on? Is that a regular thing? Or is he protesting against us? Or is he saying something about us? It's the, it's the thing he does every week. So it wasn't anything against us. You know, everyone just looked at it. They, they, some of them in an amusement, you know, in amusement of what this guy was saying, was doing. And it's just something that we've never seen up here in the Northeast. So that's, that's a little bit of a, uh, of my story about a Confederate flag. You just, you know, you have the General Lee and then you have this guy in Virginia just walking down the street as part of his, as part of his morning ritual. <laughs> so speaking of young, being a young professional, what's, what advice would you give to young professionals? So the advice I would give to, to young professionals and students, I want to group them all together because, you know, I think young professionals are just making that next step. Um, I think that you should be able to communicate with everybody. I think networking is a huge, huge point. Part of EDAC, one of our charges was to set up a network uh, database, which we have on the NATA website. So you can definitely go to the EDAC uh, section of the website, and then you can see that there's a mentoring database there. Having the opportunity to talk to others gives you an opportunity because we are, a, our profession is a, is a, a tight knit group. So you can talk to anybody. Um, I think that once you have that network, then you're able to open up doors and it'll, ask you, it'll actually let you think about how you can approach your profession in different ways. You can hear stories of how other people have done stuff, how, um, how important it is to do things one way versus the other. And I think those experiences help open up a lot of doors. One of the things I have, and I, I, I'm full of stories, so you'll learn that from the beginning. I am full of stories. Um, I actually had a student come up to me at one of the conventions and ask me, and you know my personality, you see me around. They asked me, how do you do it? I'm like, how do you do what? How do you go up to people and just talk? And, and a lot of people think because they are older and because they are Hall of Famers and because they have you know, these titles as president or as, as secretary, as treasurer, as district directors and stuff, they think that they're untouchable. They don't think that they're, you know, they're, they're out there. So, so a couple of tips of advice I would have for young professionals, find out who your, who your coworkers and your friends are talking to and go insert yourself into that conversation. That's number one. So if I see you talking to, oh, let's say, uh, Tori Lindley, right? And I don't know Tori. Let's say just hypothetically, I don't know Tori. I'm going to go over to you and I'm going to say, hey, Janet, how are you? Are you, I didn't, um, uh, can I see who you're talking to? And then take it from there. Have your friend introduce you, make a connection. And you'll realize that these aren't, you know, they aren't people on a high pedestal that can't be touched. They're athletic trainers. 
And athletic trainers are personable people and they love to talk, especially at after parties, after they have something in their hands. So they love to talk. Um, and so I tell my students, when you go to convention and you see all these guys in green jackets, you know, and the green jackets is different than what you guys have for in Augusta. Um, the green jackets are the Hall of Famers at NAPA. Introduce yourself. I want you to meet five different people today. Introduce yourself. Um, and you can throw my name in that conversation. And I want them to throw my name in that conversation because they want, I want other people to know that I'm also helping out and introducing the younger people or the, the new professionals, the young professionals to the rest of, to the rest of the membership. So I think, I think that's, uh, that's my advice for, for young professionals. What, what kind of stereotypes have you experienced in your career and how has it affected your athletic training? Being a Filipino American, you know, my, my fa I'm first generation. So my parents were born in the Philippines and they, and they came here to the States for work and stuff. Um, I wasn't really introduced, especially living in New York for, for most of my life. I wasn't really introduced or, or seen anything as, as racial. You know, obviously learning about what my family and what my culture understands is as, you know, what people are and what Filipinos are. You know, we, we have these stereotypes about Americans are, I guess, kind of, well, they have the stereotype because they were occupied by Americans during the wars, right? So they want to make sure they see these soldiers, these white, mostly white soldiers running around, you know, Charles MacArthur. Um, is it MacArthur? I can't remember his first name, but MacArthur was one of their heroes. You know, this great white uh, general was one of the heroes in the Philippines. But a lot of times they're just like, they've acclimated to the American culture. So, you know, being a lifeguard in high school, I shot outdoors a lot. And I would hear from my grandparents and my parents, hey, make sure that you're putting on sunblock. You don't want to get too dark. You know, so those are some of the cultural cues that we picked up. And they were always like, uh, you know, if you eat more, maybe it'll, it'll pull the skin a little more and, and you'll get lighter tones and you can get back to your lighter tones. And those are some of the, I mean, obviously they were joking around, but again, there was that hidden tone that it probably wasn't joking around. So, you know, taking all of that and watching where the world is now and stuff like that, turning to YouTube and watching people take their travels to the Philippines, you know, watching people live in the Philippines just to say, oh, hey, I'm a foreigner in the Philippines because I want to learn about this culture. It's kind of interesting, especially in the world we're living in now where people are traveling halfway around the world to learn about a culture where they haven't really learned about the other cultures that are within the states here. So I think that's, that's different. Going off of that, whenever I talk about meeting people that are of different culture and different areas, when they come to, to my athletic training room, you know, and I've done this at every location I've been at, whether it was at a division one or a division three or at a high school, wherever I was, you know, when a coach brings a recruit into the room, they introduce themselves. The first thing I ask is, where are you from? And they'll tell me where they're from. And the next question would be like, oh, so what's the famous food from that area? Because I know everybody is all about food. I mean, inside we're all a little foodie. So so if I ask someone from, from Minnesota, it's like, oh, talk to me about a Juicy Lucy. Or I'll go someone from San Diego, tell me about fish tacos. Or even in Atlanta, it's like, oh, tell me about the varsity. How good are those hot dogs? How good are those slaw dogs? You know? So I try to make the relationships about food. And, and that's, what, that's one way to, one, learn about the culture of the person that's coming in. And two, try to make a connection with that person. Because they're not going to know anybody when they come up to, to the school, when they start, if they come up to the institution I'm at. So they're going to figure out, you know, I met this person on my recruiting trip. This is someone I can talk to. This is someone I can remember. And, and that's all it is. I mean, just having a discussion and, and making a connection. So one of our first conversations, our connections was about tattoos and the stigma around it. Can you tell everyone else about your thoughts on the topic? Sure. Well, why don't you tell me, why don't you tell everybody first what you told me about that? Do you remember? Vaguely, vaguely. Um, I remember I have, so I personally have a lot of tattoos and I heard from another professional 
that they would not hire anyone that had visible tattoos. And that's when I approached you as a young grad representative to EDAC about how I should navigate that fact or that statement. Sure. So, I mean, going off of that, I really never thought about it. I mean, you know, you, yeah, you see people nowadays and we're talking about what, maybe 10 years from or less than 10 years from when we, saw, when we first met. Um, tattoos are a normal thing now and it's just become mainstream with it. But I understand with the time, you know, it's a part of expression. And a lot of people think that when you're a professional, you shouldn't express yourself or you shouldn't have anything to, to cause anyone to think different of you. And I think a lot of times people are making judgments based on the visual instead of, like I said before, having a conversation. And I think, I think the advice I gave to you was as long as you have, you know, as long as you look respectable and you're not flaunting your, your tattoos or anything else like that, I mean, feel free to, to have that discussion and to introduce people to it. And if they find it offensive, you know, just say, well, this is the tattoos I, I have. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm wearing appropriate clothing. And if you want to work with another athletic trainer, I understand that. That's fine. But, you know, I'm still around if you ever need anything. So I think giving them that reassurance and, and telling someone that you're a person and, and you, you understand and there's an emotional side to you as well, I think that, that's a big part of, of, of where we need to be. Let me just say on the record while we're videoing, that was so helpful because I was a grad student and hearing that and I'm about to go looking for a job and I was just completely lost and yeah and and just like I, I didn't know up from down so that was really really helpful thank you right I mean you used to tell me that you would wear long sleeves all year round and mm -hmm. you would be out in California and it was hot as heck and you'd be sweating with this with this long sleeve on it. and I'm just like if you're uncomfortable, how are you going to work on someone else who's who's uncomfortable? It's you know it's going to be a catch twenty two. So you have to be able to you know be able to do your job and look respectable and respect the other people around you. That's and look where you are now. <laughs> I'm not sure where I am, but I'm still working. I have a job, so that, that's there you something. Go. <laughs> All right, Roy. Next couple of minutes, completely for you. Your final statement. Um, I think the way that we're sitting now, you know, today I heard a, a little bit of what Doc Rivers was talking about in, in a press conference that he had, um, also listened to, to something that he was, I was listening to a podcast earlier that, that Doc Rivers was on as well. And I think it's really big to have conversations with people. I think you also have to respect people in the, where they are and you can't make assumptions about what you're seeing. A big thing about today is you never know what the other person is experiencing who you're going to have a confrontation with. So whatever you might do might trigger them. So you have to make sure that whatever you're doing, you have to treat the other person with respect. And it's that point that they feel that they, you can open up the conversation better. It's a good thing. Um, I think we learn about people by talking. And I think it's really important to talk to one another. So that's, that's one side of it. The other thing I want to talk about is I think it's really important for our profession. Now, this is talking about NATA and athletic training altogether. I think it's really important that athletic trainers understand the importance of leadership, that they understand the importance of networking, that they understand the importance of, of talking with one another. I, I think that, you know, when I took my presidency here, one of the things I talk about with my eboard is I want to make sure that out of the 10 to 12 eight athletic training programs we have in our state, I want to make sure that we are on a Zoom because Zoom is so available now and all the classes are through Zoom. So I can talk to a, a group up in, in South Canada um, that, you know, let's, talk, let's have a conversation during your administration organization class. I want them to understand that athletic training is not only what's in the books, and what, what you practice and what's hands-on and Lockman's and, and everything else. But it's also about how you can teach people about your profession. And I think that's what I learned from EDAC. I think that's, what, that's where they said athletic training 
is a huge deal. It's a healthcare profession and it's out there and people should learn about it. So I guess the message is the same. As long as you can show people your worth and talk to people and educate people on your worth, then sky's the limit. And I think that's where we need to be. And that's all I gotta say about that. <laughs> Roy, thank you so much for doing this with me and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Janet. Talk to you soon. Be well. Bye.